Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Laurel Trainer. Laurel is a cognitive neuroscientist and a senior fellow with CIFAR's Azrieli program in Brain, Mind, and Consciousness. She is the director of the Live Lab at McMaster University. You saw the Live Lab in the opening sequence where members of the Griffin Trio were hooked up to motion sensors analyzing their movement to music. Laurel is an accomplished flute player herself and she has devoted her career to understanding the role of music in development of cognition, perception, communication, and emotion. She will talk about the deep connections between music and our sense of movement and community, even at the earliest stages in life. Please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Trainer. It's wonderful to be here tonight with all of you. And I wanted to thank CIFAR, the Azriella Foundation, Michael Kerner, and the Royal Conservatory for their support in this. And of course, it's been a pleasure to work with the Griffin Trio in putting this together. Did you know that the average person spends about 13 years of their life just listening to music? Music is found in every known human culture, past and present. It has a long history going back at least 30,000 years. And today, we spend a lot of time and money on music. In fact, the US makes more money exporting music than pharmaceuticals. <laughs> music has this incredible ability to move us emotionally. It can uplift us with joy, and it can make us weep. Around the world, parents sing to their infants while they hold them and rock them. One interesting thing about music is that it's usually a social activity. We make and listen to music with other people. And whether it's musicians playing in an orchestra, people singing in church, an audience clapping or dancing to a band. And even in the modern world, when we can listen to recorded music alone by ourselves, we still feel connected with the musicians who created that music and with other people that we know also listen to that music. Now, because we make music together, we have to coordinate. Now, when you talk to someone, you have a conversation, usually you take turns. But in music, we have to play at the same time. So these musicians, for example, need to move their bows at the same time, which means that to play together, their brains have to anticipate ahead of time what to play. And they have to anticipate exactly when to play it so that they are together. They also need to coordinate their emotional expression so they communicate with their audience. If they wait to hear what the other musicians play, it's too late. In a way, we do the same thing when we move or dance to music. We need to predict when the next beat is coming so that we get our foot or other body part in the right place at the right time. It's interesting that for the most part, your brain does all this prediction and coordination without conscious awareness. In fact, it can seem to be effortless. So along with my students, uh, Andrew Chang, Haley Cragness, and Stephen Livingston, we were interested in how musicians move in order to communicate during a musical performance. So as you saw in the opening video, we brought the Griffin Trio into the live lab at McMaster University. So the Live Lab is a very unique space. It's a beautiful concert hall, but at the same time, it's a research lab. It has an active acoustic system with 28 microphones and 76 loudspeakers, and it can reproduce the acoustics of a cathedral, a subway station, or a fine concert hall. In the Live Lab, we can measure heartbeats and brainwaves, or EEG, in multiple musicians and audience members 
during actual performances. At the top of the slide here, you see an EG cap being placed on an audience member. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about some of our studies with EEG. We can also measure how people move in great detail using our motion capture system. As you saw in the video, we placed reflective markers on Roman, Anna Lee, and Jamie. As they played, our 24 special infrared cameras recorded the positions of these markers. And from this information, we constructed three-dimensional models of their movements. So let's look a little bit more detail at these movements. So Jamie here, this is Jamie, shown by these point light markers. To play the piano, all he needs to do really is move his fingers at the right time, push the keys at the right time. And similarly, Anna Lee here and Roman here, all they need to do is, is pull their bow across the strings uh, at the right time, coordinated, of course, with their left hand fingering. Now, this in itself is a very complex feat and takes years of practice. But to do this, they don't have to move the rest of their bodies. But they do move their heads, and they do sway their bodies when they play. So we measured and analyzed these movements to see if they used them to communicate emotion with each other. So the question was, did they use movements to convey a common emotional expression? So that they were not just three musicians playing at the same time, but they were communicating the meaning of the music. So now I'm actually going to play for you the video of them uh, playing O Tono Porteno by Astor Piazzolla. And these points here, you probably can tell, these are their heads, these are their shoulders and their arms, this is the violin, and this is the cello. So you see you can get quite a bit of information just from their movements. Next, I'm going to play you two videos. We asked them to play, during their trip to the Live Lab, the same piece twice. So in one version, we asked them to play without musical expression, so that is, without emotion. And in the other version, we asked them to play expressively, conveying the emotion of the piece, whatever it was. I'm now going to show you these two videos of the point light displays. I've taken out, as you can see, I've taken out their lower arms and their instruments, so that really all you can see now is their head movements and their body sway. Now, both of these versions, the expressive version and the non-expressive version, will play at the same time. And I want you to see whether you think version A at the top or version B at the bottom is the version in which they were playing expressively to communicate the emotion. Just give you a heads up, you might want to look at Roman here. When the first time I met Roman, he told me he wears his emotion on his sleeve, so he might move more than the others. Uh, but also look at Jamie's head movements, they're quite interesting. And look at the way Annalise sways her body. Now after you watch these, we're going to ask you to actually rate, tell us which one is the piece in which they were playing expressively. Okay, so now it's time to take out those clickers that you were given when you entered the auditorium. And if you think the expressive version was the top one, press A on your clicker. If you think the expressive version was the bottom one, press B on your clicker. Okay, so let's, let's see how you responded. <laughs> Whoa! You guys are good. So you see, Without even hearing the music, you can tell how expressively they're playing just from their body movements. Now, I'm going to play you two more videos, and this time, we asked them to play some pieces that expressed a happy emotion and some pieces that expressed a sad emotion. And I want you to decide, is the top one or the bottom one playing the happy emotion? Okay, here we go. Okay, let's see these results. 
Wow. Exactly the same. I don't know what that means. Yeah. So the important thing here is that it was pretty easy for you to tell just from their movements without any sound when they were playing a happy piece and when they were playing a sad piece. Now I trust that I have made you anticipate how these pieces actually sound for long enough. So now we have the treat of actually hearing the Griffin Trio play these two pieces. question we asked about their movements was, when they play expressively and they are actually, are they actually communicating better with each other than when they play non-expressively? So we analyzed this using a technique called Granger causality. So represented here on the x-axis is time, and represented here on the y-axis is the body sway of musician one and the body sway of musician two. Now here's the key with Granger causality. If we take a particular point in time, say here, what we want to know is can we predict the movements of musician two from the prior movements of musician one, over and above any prediction we can do within a musician. If we can, if the movements of musician one here predict how musician two is going to move here, then that tells us that they are communicating through their movements. We can look at how much each musician's body sway affects or predicts each other musician's body sway. So for example, how well does the violinist predict the movements of the cellist? How well does the cellist predict the movements of the violinist? And we can take the sum of all six of these relationships, and this tells us how well the musicians are communicating as a group. And we call this group coupling. So here, we compare the expressive and the non-expressive performances of these pieces. And here we did it for all the happy pieces, and you can see that the expressive pieces in yellow have greater group coupling than the non-expressive pieces that are shown in white. Same thing is true for the sad pieces. Again, you see that the group coupling was higher when they played expressively than when they played non-expressively. So these results tell us that body sway is actually helping them to communicate emotional information to each other about how to play the piece, and it's affecting how the piece unfolds in time. So body movements communicate emotion. When the trio played, did you find yourself tapping your foot? Or at least you might have felt an urge to do that? 
Next, I'd like to talk a little bit more about why rhythms are so powerful and how the brain processes rhythms. Rhythms occur in music, of course, but they occur in many biological systems. So we walk rhythmically, speech has a rhythm, our heartbeats are rhythmic. One of the most important things about rhythms is that they are predictable. When the notes are spaced evenly in time, like this, you can predict with very high accuracy when the next beat is going to occur. So rhythms are incredibly useful because knowing when something is going to occur allows you to focus your attention at that point in time. And this allows you to be prepared for what is going to happen at that point in time. In fact, we can think about the brain as an organ that is always trying to predict the future. Through evolution, this was incredibly important. To survive, for example, you needed to be able to predict what direction a lion was going to go in and when it would reach you to make sure that you would not be at that place at that time. Now today, if you are a team sports player, it isn't enough to know where the other players are now. You need to know where they're going to be a few moments from now. This is Russell Westbrook. He plays now for Oklahoma City, and he's one of the main reasons why they did so well this year. Here he is when he was playing college basketball for UCLA. His teammate here has the ball. He is trying to pass the ball to someone who can get closer to the net. So he might predict that Russell is going to move in here, and Russell might predict that if he starts moving here, he will throw him the ball. If this guy on the other team doesn't also predict that, he's going to get scored on. So to play basketball, you need to be able to dribble and pass and shoot, but one of the most important things is to be able to predict where the other players are going to be and be in the right place at the right time. Music makes use of our ability to predict the future. Rhythms in music, shown by the musical notes in yellow here, set up expectations that the most important notes are going to occur on strong beats. And our attention goes up and down with the rhythm of the music. So for example, if musicians, God forbid, played a wrong note, you would be much better able to detect that if the wrong note was on a strong beat than if the wrong note was played on a weak beat. And the quartet is just going to illustrate this for us. They're going to play a little excerpt from Haydn and see if you hear a wrong note in what they play. <laughs> Okay, I think you heard that. <laughs> They're now going to play a wrong note, but it's not going to be on a strong beat. Did you hear that? Very subtle, yeah. So this waxing and waning of attention that's set up by rhythms is very important. Now, how does our brain do this? Well, neurons in the brain communicate with each other through electrical signals. When a group of neurons depolarize and fire together, they create an electrical field that we can measure at the surface of the head. And this is called the electroencephalogram, or EEG. Now, we can take a recording of EEG, like the one that's shown here, and we can use Fourier analysis to decompose it into a series of oscillations. So you see slow oscillations here, or low frequency oscillations, medium ones here, and fast or high frequency oscillations here. And these different oscillations actually reflect very important brain processes. So what does this have to do with rhythm? Well, 
In our research, we've shown that when a person listens to a musical beat, some of these brain oscillations entrain or synchronize to the beat. So the brain is a bit like a resonator. The neural oscillations in your brain line up with the rhythm of the musical input. So what you see here are actual brain responses to a series of equally spaced beats. And these were measured by Takako Fujioka, who was my postdoc at the time. So the musical beats are shown here. This is what the person actually heard. And you can see they're evenly spaced in time. The x-axis represents time. And on the y-axis, we have low frequencies here going up to higher frequencies here. Now, the colors represent energy. So red represents a lot of energy, and blue represents very low energy. And so what you can see is that after a beat, if we look at these middle frequencies here around 20 hertz, after a beat, there's a decrease in energy, decrease in this oscillation. And then it rebounds so that it reaches a maximum at the time of the next beat. And then we get another decrease after that beat, and again it rebounds so it reaches a maximum at the time of the next beat. This is the brain predicting when the next beat is going to occur. If we slow down the tempo, so now you see these beats are spaced further in time, the brain responses also slow down. So we still get the decrease and increase, decrease and increase, but it's now entrained to this slower tempo. So this is the brain predicting when the next beat will occur. And this is what the brains of musicians are doing when they are playing. It's what enables them to play together. And this is also what your brain is doing when you listen to music. Your brain entrains to the beat. Even when you're just listening and you're not playing music and you're not even moving, your brain is predicting when the next beat is going to occur. Now, it's interesting that this anticipation or prediction of the beat occurs in your brain without you even being aware of it. You're not conscious of it. And remember this because in the second half, Robert is going to talk about how these expectations actually affect your emotional responses to music. Now, we can actually look across the whole brain, and we can look at which areas of the brain show this entrainment to the beat. Well, not too surprisingly, we see it in auditory cortex, and that's the part of the brain that processes sound. But we also see it in the supplementary motor area and in the cerebellum. These are parts of the brain that have to do with movement, nothing to do really with hearing. But this is why when you listen to music with a beat, you feel an urge to move, whether tapping your toe or breakdancing. Even if you don't actually move, the motor circuits in your brain are preparing you to move to the beat. So again, we see this very powerful connection between auditory rhythms and movements. Now, movements are very important in another way. Musical rhythms set up social dynamics. If two or more people listen to the same music and they all move to that music, they're going to move at the same tempo. This has important social consequences because when two people move in synchrony, Afterwards, they feel more socially affiliated. Have you ever wondered why we have music at virtually every occasion when we want to feel common emotion with others? We have music at weddings to feel joy together. We have music at funerals to feel grief together. We have music at religious ceremonies and at parties. We have music and rhythmic chants at sporting events to feel one with other fans. And we have music in the military to promote solidarity. So experiments have found, for example, that if two adults move in synchrony with each other, afterwards, 
they cooperate more with each other, they trust each other more, and they like each other more in comparison to people who move out of sync with each other. Again, for the most part, we're not consciously aware that synchronous movement has these effects on us, but they can be quite powerful. So how early in development can we see pro-social effects of movement synchronization? Well, to anticipate, the answer is we can see them very early. Now, the motor system of infants is very immature at birth. It takes months before an infant can even sit up or roll over. So for the most part, infants are not able to precisely move in time to a beat. So, to test whether synchronous movements with another person affect their social behavior, another graduate student of mine, Laura Sorelli, and I decided that we would move infants. So specifically, we bounced them. Here is our experimental setup. This is a 14-month-old infant, and this assistant here is holding the infant, and the infant is listening to Twist and Shout by the Beatles. <laughs> and this assistant is the bouncer. So she bounces up and down, and bounces the infant up and down in time to the music. This is the experimenter. She faces the infant, and she bounces according to whatever she hears over her headphones. And sometimes her beat track makes her in sync with an infant, but for another infant, she might be out of sync with that infant and bounce either too fast or too slow. After this experience, we then see how willing these infants are to help this experimenter that they either bounced in sync with or out of sync with. So in this first video, you will see an infant being bounced in sync with the experimenter. So let's take a look. So in this second video, you're now going to see whether that infant who bounced in sync with the experimenter helped the experimenter in our tasks. Put it right there. Oh, no. Oopsie. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Okay, in this next video, you're going to see an infant bounced out of sync with the experimenter. And now see whether this infant helps the experimenter. There. Uh oh. Oh no. <laughs> we learned was that those infants who were bounced in sync with the experimenter for just two and a half minutes helped her much more than those infants who were bounced out of sync. The power of music. So in a second study, we examined whether infants who were bounced in sync with one person would help a stranger who just sat here and didn't bounce with them? And the answer was no, they didn't. Infants don't help strangers who don't bounce with them. <laughs> but in another condition, the infant bounced still with just the one experimenter, but the infants also saw a skit where this experimenter interacted with this stranger so that it was clear that they were friends. And in this case, the infants did help friends of in-sync bouncers. 
So this is pretty sophisticated. Infants are using their knowledge of social relationships and using cues of music to decide on their social behavior. So around the world, caregivers sing to infants and rock them to sleep and bounce them to play with them. We now know that infants use rhythm as a powerful cue to navigate their social world and decide who to trust and who to befriend. So let me sum up. Music makes us feel emotions. Much of the power of music to move us results from the predictions that music sets up. These predictions enable us to move in time to music and to play in sync with other people. And moving together can strengthen bonds and increase cooperation and altruistic behavior. So these research findings also have important clinical applications. For example, music can be used to help mothers with postpartum depression to bond with their infants. Training with musical rhythms can help children with dyslexia. And moving to music can help Parkinson's patients to walk. And now we will end the first half with you having the privilege of feeling the rhythm and feeling the emotion and perhaps feeling some affiliation with your neighbors while the Griffin Trio plays the second movement of Lalo's Piano Trio Number no. 3. Thank you. 